On this week's Motor Week, we're focusing on power and performance. And who better to take us through the next half hour than that die-hard boy racer, Richard Hammond. As well as our three-car GTI shootout, we'll be buying a supercar for under 15 grand. And looking at a two-seat sports car from Japan with a bit of a difference. Not so very long ago, forbidden fruit meant just that, forbidden fruit, an apple on the Tree of Wisdom in the Garden of Eden. Of course, they ate it. Well, it would, wouldn't you? Things then got a bit more sophisticated and the humble apple was replaced with forbidden pleasures like, mm, chocolate. Thing is, nowadays, obviously, we'd expect things to be a little bit more sophisticated, and they are, because our forbidden fruit is something like this, the Mitsubishi FTO. Forbidden because until recently Mitsubishi refused to bring it into the country officially. Now that they've bowed to pressure from the likes of you and me, and they are. But here's my point. Now it's no longer forbidden fruit. It's no longer a bit of naughty fun. So is it boring? Or is it still exciting? You'll find out. <laughs> oh dear. I think I might have got the coffee cream here because the interior is more than a little bit disappointing. It's plasticky and bland and looks about 15 years out of date. The only thing in its favour is it's Mitsubishi, so it'll last for thousands of years. The centre console particularly is just a kind of lumpy, bumpy mess. I don't think anybody designed that at all. And where's the tactile delights of a nice feeling steering wheel and a gear lever that's something other than this rather nasty old thing? Don't tell me the reality is going to be a disappointment. Bring back the fantasy. still looks right. You know, Japanese sports cars really aren't usually sold on their good looks, it's usually some clever piece of techno wizardry. But in the case of the FTO, I think there's an exception. It is a genuinely pretty little sports car. It looks squat and purposeful, it's low and mean, it's angular where it needs to be and curvaceous where it teases and tempts. If I am going to criticise it, it's a criticism I'd usually level at Mitsubishi, and their 323F was as guilty of this. The wheels are too small, 16 inch. These need 17 inches at least, but hey, that's easily fixed. Just before I go, one thing I really like, the spoiler. Doesn't look like it's just been slapped on any old house and afterthought. It's integrated into the shape of the car. I like that. It is a Mitsubishi sports car, so you wouldn't expect me to say it's entirely bog standard and boring under the skin. And it isn't. What you get is a rather clever 2 litre V6 engine with 197 brake horsepower, which is quite a lot actually. 60 miles an hour comes up in 7.3 seconds, not at all bad. Interestingly, it has what Mitsubishi called MiVec, which is the equivalent of Honda's VTEC or Rover's variable valve control system. It's a bit of jiggery pokery which changed the characteristics of the engine according to the revs. So get past 6,000 and it releases full power. That said, it's not as pronounced effect as in some Honda VTEC systems, which is both a good and a bad thing. Maybe it's not as exciting, but it does mean you're not stuck with almost a turbo lag feeling at low revs and it all goes crazy at high revs. It's a bit more usable. Where it does very well 
is in the suspension department. It is a very firm ride. You know you're in a sports car and not a tour or a shopping machine. But it grips, it holds the road, it forces the wheels onto the road at all times. It feels like a little sports car, which it is. The controls generally are pretty precise and eager and responsive. There's plenty of talk back for the steering. The brakes are up to the job, if not spectacular. And the same goes for the gearbox. It changes gear. It doesn't get in the way, but I wouldn't say it's a delight to use. But none of the controls are so in your face as to spoil the fun of driving the thing. It's what you want from a sports car. This was the kind of thing I had in mind when I found out I was going to try my forbidden fruit. A bit of luxury. Did it measure up? Well, on the outside, yes, I think it looked the part. It was every bit the box of chocolates, the bottle of champagne, or the bowl of fruit. Inside, well, yeah, it was a bit of a disappointment. It was less of this and more this. A bit disappointing, but not disastrous. And overall, well, yeah, I'd say a forbidden fruit measured up. It was every bit the dream I'd hoped for. Mm. So you get to be the wrong side of 25. That's it then, is it? I've got three letters for you. M, P, V. Come on. An end to motoring mayhem. No more four-wheel fun. Or is it the end? Because what if you get another car? A second one. You get permission from the Home Office to go and buy something special. With a budget of, say, 14 and a bit grand, I must be able to get something special. Something from here. Woohoo! Come to Papa! Ooh, there you are. Oh. Wow, little boy in big sweetie shop. Oh yeah, this place has everything. Something tells me that the folks here are not going to be too impressed with my little bulge. The one in my wallet, that is, obviously. Now, there must be something in here for my budget somewhere. Shop! The salesman didn't actually laugh when I said 14 grand. In fact, eventually, he gave me some keys. Take the dark grey one, he said. Sounds promising. Oh, Salika. Well, that's not bad, I suppose. Are you serious? Oh yes, that is more like it. For 14 grand. <laughs> this I can cope with. This is a lotus. to drive either. Just a case of point and squirt and grin and it goes around the corners. <laughs> it does feel great. Yeah. Aficionados of the brand will already have noticed that this car is not entirely standard. The rear spoiler on the boot, the front balance, even the seats have all been added from later cars. But it doesn't really matter, they've all been nicely put on and the whole effect is uh, <laughs> you can 
considering its age, and it's done what? 80 odd thousand miles. This thing actually feels surprisingly tight and new, but then it will have been looked after. Odds are when you're buying a supercar like this, it's not a car that even at this stage in his life, he's ever really taken for granted. You can assume it will have been serviced before you get home. Of course, buying yourself a supercar for just 14 grand is fine until something goes wrong. And then it'll end up in here. And then, well, if it's a Lotus, it's going to cost you a lot. So I think it's about time we went and talked turkey with the dealer. So Neil, you've taken the plunge, say you've spent your £14,000 on a Lotus. Take your salesman hat off for a moment. I'll try. Is it going to break me in the first year of ownership? No, it's not. But it would be naive to think you're not going to get any problems with a car of this age. But it can be put right. You, sure. going, the things that cost you ordinarily on a car, when you're running, what okay. is a supercar, even at 14,000, they're going to cost you more. So, insurance. It ain't no hot hatch, is it, to insure? Well, no, but uh, if uh, a car of this type is more than 10 years old, then it qualifies to be on a classic car insurance scheme. And you're going to save a lot of money there, probably several thousand. Yeah. What about depreciation? Well, this one's done all its depreciating already, so virtually non-existent. You see, I'm thinking like how I justify this to my bank manager. So actually, mm. the money you've saved there will probably pay for the money that you're going to have to pay to keep the thing running. Well, like, you could look at it that way, yes. I'm I going mean, to. <laughs> yeah, you might, you might spend two or three thousand in the year maintaining the car. But money but, well spent. You know. Say we've decided then, that's it. It's got to be a Lotus Esprit. Quickly tell us, what were the models? Uh, 1988 launch, turbo or non-turbo, limited editions all the way through, different variants, up to the V8 Esprit, 1995. Now that's that big and serious supercar that's performance. The... For that you'll pay... 30, upwards of £30,000. It's a lot of car for the money. But if we've got 14000 to buy one of these, mm -hmm. what should we look for and beware of? Well, a full service history would be lovely. Making sure the chassis numbers line up is... is Definitely a good idea. If all that information isn't spot on, get it checked out by an established uh, specialist. And if they give the OK, it's a case of pluck up your courage, trunks on, jump in, buy one. Have the time. You can try and justify it to the bank manager as many times and in as many different ways as you like. And sure, if you're very lucky, it may end up costing you no more to run for a year than a Mondeo. But if it does, don't forget, this isn't just a car, it's a hobby. And all hobbies cost money, be they golf or a, a spot of fishing. It all takes cash. So you've got a choice, really. These or this. Well, I know which I'd have. That's it for part one of Motor Week, but keep watching because after the break we've got our three-car GTI Battle Royale between the Renault Clio 172, Honda Civic Type R and the MG ZR. Which one comes out on top? Find out after the break. The Hot Hatch. Proof that there is a god, and he's our kind of bloke. Just look at him, nestling. It seems a shame to go up and disturb him. Maybe I should just leave him there. Nah, let's get him. Today, we are going to have fun, a lot of fun, and all in the name of science, because we are gathered here, all of us, to do awful things to three of the hottest, sexiest little numbers you can buy, at least on our budget. From France and looking hot to trot is the Kia Sport 172, complete with a newly revised face. And then an English rose in naughty underwear, the MG ZR 160. Just don't say Rover, it thinks we can't tell. And finally, a touch of the exotic is the Honda Civic Type R. Stripped bare of frills and fripperies, it's more than ready to get back to basics. Grr, I'm a tiger. And so we brought them out here, where we can be alone together and where they can stretch their legs a bit. The only problem is... I can't decide which one to drive first. 
These are not cars that we buy for their economy or their prowess in the supermarket car park. So we're going to keep things simple. The winner at the end of the day will be the one that looks the sexiest, goes the best and doesn't leave us completely broke. The old Renault 5 GT Turbo was no slouch, of course, and their new Clio V6 is, well, sheer lunacy. This, though, is probably a slightly more realistic version of the hot hatch, and it's certainly not short of go. Renault recently tweaked the interior of the Clio, and for this sport version, it was much needed and actually means it feels pretty good. There's quite a sense of occasion in here. It feels quite proper. You are immediately hit, though, by the Clio's big problem, and that is the driving position. It's a bit truck-like. It's not quite right. I don't have quite the right adjustment on the wheel, and that's a shame, because other than that, it's a great hot hatch. There's plenty of power, 172 brake horsepower. The clue is in the name, Clio 172. That's from a two-litre engine, and there's loads of mid-range urge, so you've always got power. It's only after a while, though, do you start to spot the problem. When we say hot hatch, I expect something raucous and edgy, whereas the Clio, well, it's a very, very supple, fluid ride. It's very comfortable, maybe too comfortable. And the steering, well, it's very quick, but I'm not getting a lot back through the steering wheel. I'm a bit isolated from it. Basically, I think the thing is just a bit too French and sophisticated to be a, a raucous, badass hot hatch. You might think of Honda as a brand more concerned with fitting pension book holders and pork pie hat brackets on the parcel shelf than with performance. But you'd be wrong, very wrong. Cars like the NSX, the Integra Type R, and the Accord Type R bear testament to that. And this, the Civic Type R, is their take on a hot hatch. And they've gone very much for the bare, stripped out racer feel. Works for me. <laughs> and straight away, this feels a lot more like a hot, hot hatch. Where the Clio is supple and gentle in the ride, this is harsh and crashy and like a hot hatch of the old school, which I like. There's plenty of power, nearly 196 brake horsepower from a two-litre engine, and it's fitted with Honda's clever VTEC system, which changes the characteristics. At low revs, it's pretty docile and, to be honest, a little bit flat. At high revs, and I mean high, like seven and a half, it's fantastic. The world just goes crazy. It's also much more like an old-fashioned hot hatch in terms of the interior. We've got gripping bucket seats. The driving position is great. I feel really in control when I'm getting a bit of a shift on. And finally, the MG ZR160. And just a few years ago, who'd have thought there'd even be an MG in a hot hatch test? I really, really want to like it in here. I do, I want to like it. I don't like it. I'm sorry, it's just a Rover 25 in here with no walnut, basically. When it comes to the actual drive, though, the important business, well, it's not as powerful as the other two. There's only 160 brake horsepower from a 1.8 litre engine, so we have to forgive it that. But once you're underway, even when you take that into consideration, somehow it's not quite as thrilling as the other two. It is still a hot hatch though, despite all of that. It still feels sporty and nimble and quick. It's just it is against some pretty stiff competition here. And it just doesn't feel as exciting. And so the performance verdict. And in third place, it's the MG. It really isn't the car's fault, and maybe it is a bit unfair. It's down on power compared to the other two. And it just can't cut it in this company. And then it got very, very close, but second, was the Clio. It really is very, very close, and the Clio nearly made it to the top slot, but it got knocked down just because of that ride being perhaps a little bit too soft. And so the number one drive of our hot hatch trio is the Civic. It is a very tight competition between these two, but the Civic Type R makes it to the top simply because it's the closest to an old-fashioned hot hatch, fast and raucous. And so, for the verdict, well, there's got to be a loser, and I'm afraid it is 
the Rover. Oh, sorry, the MG. I'd love it to have won, but I guess it is the smallest, the least expensive, and the most underpowered of the three, so maybe it always was a little bit unfair, and it did pretty well. Second place goes to the Renault Clio Sport. It is a fantastic little hot hatch. There's loads of mid-range urge from that engine. It's a dynamite drive down country lanes, and it would have won if it wasn't for, in the first place, the Honda Civic Type R. Compared to the other two, it is razor sharp. There's huge fun to be had at the top of the rev range thanks to that clever VTEC system. And for a hot hatch, it's actually a very practical, spacious car, making it very much a worthy winner. So on the road and on paper, the Civic Type R is our three car winner. It may be the dearest car and the most expensive to insure, but those performance figures speak for themselves. The Clio 172 was a close second, and the MG ZR, whilst it was in third place, with a 0-60 time of 7.4 and for only 13 and a half grand, that's pretty good performance for not much money. As fabulous as GTIs are, they don't quite cut the mustard when it comes to the F word, family. So on next week's programme we're looking at a range of family cars including the all new Toyota Corolla and the latest version of Nissan's Primera. See you next week.